This is Eric Alvarez. One quick note before we begin. This episode is available in Spanish. You are listening to the English version, which means I'm going to try to say soccer instead of football. Para escucharlo en español, busca el podcast Mi Mundialista Favorito. Paul Arriola has been called the best winger in the league for his play with FC Dallas. The U.S. soccer star is seemingly unstoppable on the pitch. He scores! Goal! Arriola! But off the field, it's a different story. I, I was always wondering when, you know, when would I go through a really difficult time? I had always felt that I had gone through difficult times, but I never really thought... I always thought, when is, when is something going to hit me? You know when everything's going really well and you feel like it's just too good to be true and something bad is going to happen? For Paul, that moment came in 2017. Paul's invincibility on the pitch couldn't protect him from the experiences that make us all human. Trauma, loss, unshakable grief. And as you would come to learn, our physical and mental health are more intertwined than we think. Right after his grandfather passed, he tore his ACL. 2017 up until 2020, year, ba years back to back to back, um, I faced a lot of hardship and I kept wondering, you know, when is it going to stop and can I keep going? Um, and kind of the only thing that, that really pushed me was just playing, just being, just being a, a professional athlete and, and being able to forget about everything that you're going through on the field. I'm former Colombian striker Juan Pablo Angel. And I'm LX News host Eric Alvarez. This is my new favorite footballista where we introduce you to some of football's brightest stars and the causes they're fighting for off the pitch. Juan Pablo, have you ever lost anyone important to you? Absolutely, Eric. I, I did lost uh, important people in my life. And also, it, it was long ago, but it was a very difficult time with the history of Colombia at the time. There was a lot of violence and a lot of, you know, teammates uh, or friends or family members that I've lost. At that time, there was a lot of emotions that uh, I didn't even have a name uh, mm -hmm. for them. Uh, so we talk about mental, mental health. We talk about a lot of things right now that, you know, before, uh, we didn't know what it was. Paul Ariola says he didn't have to face that sort of loss until he was already playing professional soccer. I, I've never really had to deal with any big loss or trauma or anything like that, um, kind of until I turned uh, 21, 22 years old is kind of when I started to really feel life started to happen, you know, in, in that direction where life is real mm -hmm. and life is um, <clears throat> something that that is, is a part of highs and lows and all these things. My father was a, 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 an alcoholic and um, my mother and him were going through a divorce. Um, that, was, that was very tough for my brother and I. And, and so for me, that was kind of the first taste of it. And, um, you know, my, fa my father had passed away um, from a heart attack when I was in Virginia. I was laying in bed um, and I remember my mom just giving me a call. Till this day, I still get the chills just thinking about that very moment. That's Paul's fiance, Akela Banuelos. We were minutes away from falling asleep and his phone just lit up and I instantly knew something bad happened, but I wasn't sure exactly what, you know, the phone call was gonna be about. And to see Paul so broken was like the worst thing I can ever, ever see. Paul says losing his dad was the hardest day of his life, but what helped him was putting on his cleats and going back onto the field. To be honest with you, soccer helped me a ton. Um, it really did. I, I went home um, to spend time with my family for about a week. I missed one game, and after that um, I flew back, and within two days we had another game. I ended up playing in the game and, and, and kind of just going on from there. And soccer was my safe space. You know, the field was my safe space. Being able just to not always think about losing your, my father, 
it was just a, it was just a, a a space where I was able just to focus on playing, just focus on the ball, focus on uh, you know tactics and fo- you know like all these uh, uh, things that that involve playing at an elite level. Um, and so for me, it really really helped me. You know, continue to play the rest of the, the rest of the season, um, and then after that, kind of took some downtime in the in the off season to kind of uh, absorb um, kind of what what had happened. Paul is. He puts his heart and everything he has into soccer. Every game, every practice. And he had a game shortly after. And I was like, I'm not prepared for this. I don't think you're prepared for this. I'm not sure how you're going to take this. I don't want you to get injured. And he went onto that field and did amazing. And right after the game, he looked for me in the crowd and I ran down the stairs as fast as I could. And I'm crying because I'm like, this is like amazing for him. But also like, I don't know how he's going to react right now. And he just came running over to me and he just started bawling his eyes out. And just as Paul was starting to come to terms with his father's death, his family was hit with another tragedy a year later. His grandfather, the man who fostered Paul's athletic abilities as a child became sick. The thing that I remember the most about like my grandfather, as much as I love soccer, I loved baseball just as much from when I was two, three years old. Um, and my grandfather, whenever I'd go to visit them living in San Diego, um, we'd always go to the park. He would take a bat, like a couple baseballs, I'd go, uh, you know, I'd go at the park um, and he would just be popping these balls up in the air just for me to go run and catch them. Um, and that was kind of our thing. 2018, he, he was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer um, <clears throat> and then passed away in, 20, in 2019. You know, when my grandfather was going through it, I, you know, I've heard people say pancreatic cancer is one of the worst cancers to have, and it's one of the most painful ones. And I remember my grandmother calling me the night um, that he was going, that she thought he, he was going to pass. Um, and I remember her calling me. I remember just having a, a very, very light conversation with him, uh, just letting him know that I, that I loved him. And so that, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to be able to have had a final conversation with him um, just because I had lost my father but prior to that and, I, and, and it was such a tragic moment that I didn't know it was coming. That was a moment that you kind of just wish that you had someone to, you know, to, to speak to that person one more time um, and, and let them know how much you care for them and love them. And so I was really grateful for that, <clears throat> for that moment to be able to, to talk to my grandfather one more time. And then in 2019, my uh, mother-in-law was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. In less than two years, Paul had lost two loved ones and was facing the threat of losing a third one. His fiance's mother, a woman who frequently traveled on the road with Paul and Akela. They call her their road dog. And while all of this was happening, his father's death, his grandfather's cancer, his mother-in-law's diagnosis, Paul kept it going on the field, scoring 20 goals and 16 assists for DC United and proudly wearing the shirt of the U.S. national team in two under-20 World Cups. Paul was already sending a message through his playing on the field, but there was another message he wanted to send to the world. We're there at the game. First of all, I'm excited that he scores because now my whole family and friends and his friends get to see that. But then he lifts up his shirt and I'm like, what did that say? And I look closer and I see it and everybody like, near us just looked at my mom and we all kind of just started crying because it was just such a sweet gesture. My mother-in-law had been going through a really, really rough time. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it had appeared like the cancer was kind of progressing and um, we were gonna go play in LA against the Galaxy. I didn't know if my, my mother-in-law was going to be able to go to the game, but I obviously knew that she would be watching the game for sure. Um, and I just thought if this is the last time she ever gets to see me play, uh, I want to send a message. The evening of May 14th, 2022 in Los Angeles, after scoring the second goal against the Galaxy, Paul lifted his jersey to reveal that message. My message uh, has been F cancer. Paul designed the shirt himself, a white shirt with bold black letters, 
spelling out F asterisk asterisk K, cancer. A simple design with a big message, a tribute to his loved ones impacted by the disease. But when you play professional sports, something as simple as a teacher can get complicated fast. I had my agent reach out to the league, see like, hey, like, you know, is this going to get me, you know, suspend? How many games is, is this going to get me suspended? Is this going to, you know, is this going to, am I going to have to pay a fine? What's the fine? All of these different, like, things are running through my head. Our, our kit guy is trying to help me figure out, like, what's the right message to send? You know, is it just the, you know, is it F? Is it the, the, the asterisk? Like, what are we going to do, you know? And uh, finally, we just came up with the, with the, uh, the asterisk and, and, you know, the cut, the, the, the sleeveless top and, I just said, you know what, if I get a chance to score, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it. Um, and I was so thankful that, that I was able to, to score and she was there. I didn't even know he was going to do that. Um, I was in shock. So we were in hopes that my mom would go to this game because she started declining a little bit this year. And I told her, I said, mom, you have somewhat strength. Like, let's go. Like, we'll help you. All of us will help you. My family is there. We're all going to go. Whether that's your last game or not, like, you're gonna go. We're gonna make you go and you're gonna go. And because he did it for my mom and for his grandpa, he didn't realize the outcome of how special it was to other people going through that. I, I wore it on, on my shirt um, and I got so much support from that. Um, and that just felt so good being able to show my support to other people, people that I don't necessarily know. Um, but remind them that that they're not alone, you know. And I had so I had so many messages on social media, just about you know I I've lost a family member to cancer. I've overcame cancer. Um, I'm battling cancer. All these different things. It was definitely a message just to everyone that was watching. And again, like just the people that that it can positively affect. Um, you know, I, I'm just so grateful that that was it, and I've been wearing it every game since. It's a message that still hits close to home for Paul, as Akela's mom is still fighting cancer. She's hanging in there. It's There's this thing that she can't do anymore, so we're holding on to hope as she starts for new treatment, but the new treatment is harsh, and she will feel different, and she will lose her hair this time around, so it's been a process for her and for all of us because we don't know how to make her feel great you know when she also knows that this is the biggest year and she wants to keep you know living and pushing forward but it's been so difficult and we're just hoping that this obstacle will only get easier for her. So we could end this episode right here right now and leave you with the idea that despite the trauma Paul was dealing with Everything professionally was going well for him. He was playing for Team USA, taking a stand, and making an impact on the fans in the stadium. But that is not uh, the whole story, because despite our desire to make athletes superhuman, that's just it. We are human, and as fast as police, no one can outrun grief. And he learned that the hard way. Here is Akela. So it worried me um, that whole year just because I just felt I wasn't sure how he was going to react to him. He had to push it all aside and just keep, keep moving, which is, I mean, he's amazing. I mean, I think that's one of the greatest things about him is that he's very strong. But in the end, it did hurt him a little bit because he wasn't able to feel. And then things got a little bit better, but not really, because then right after his grandfather passed, and then right after that, he tore his ACL. The injury was so severe, there were worries the tear would force him to sit out the entire 2020 season. And it was almost like the world was just crumbling on him. We spoke to Dr. Stephanie Coakley, Senior Associate Athletic Director for Mental Health, Wellness, and Performance at Temple University. Now, she hasn't worked with Paul, but she is one of the country's leading experts on sports psychology and the impact things like trauma and grief can have on athletes. When we told her uh, Paul had torn his ACL while grieving the loss of his father and grandfather, she wasn't surprised. 
at all. Grief, especially on process and on express grief is going to be experienced as a stressor, right? And when our stress is high, we put ourselves at risk for injury or illness. And so the best thing that could happen to you is not performing your best. <laughs> and the worst thing that can happen to you is that you could tear, tear something because of um, not paying attention. You know, somebody might, you might get hit because you're not paying attention or too much stress to create muscle tension. And so if you go down on, you know, you twist your ankle, if you didn't have that level of stress in your body, it's a strained ankle, but because of that intense um, grief, AKA stress, now you have a more serious injury. Even for people who aren't pro athletes, grief can express itself in lots of physical ways. So when we don't deal with the heavy emotions we experience throughout our lives, it can take a toll on our psychological and physical well-being. The grief can ma manifest itself in stomach pains, insomnia, chest pain, headache and migraine. For a person who might have an underlying condition, that condition might be exacerbated. So, I mean, that's one of the, one of the, I guess, risks of ignoring or neglecting this emotion of grief is that after a while, your body makes you, it demands that you address what you've been ignoring or neglecting. We also asked her about Paul's return to the field right after his father's death in 2018 and the pressure athletes feel to perform regardless of personal challenges. So sometimes I see it um, really glamorized that, you know, so-and-so lost their father this morning and they're on the field this afternoon. So that has definitely been something that has been promoted, which I'm, it depends on who you are, but not everybody can do that. And, you know, it, we have to give people space and place to grieve. When it comes to pro athletes, we see this happen all the time. The day after his father's death, Green Bay Packers quarterback Brett Favre was heralded for scoring four touchdowns in what was called a magical performance. Golfer Tom Wixpoth uh, won the 1994 Franklin Quest Championship two days after the death of his close friend. And during the 2014 Stanley Cup playoffs, Martin San Louis of the New York Rangers learned his mother had died of a heart attack. He went on to score the first goal of the game. Juan Pablo, this might be a, a tough question, but during your playing days, was there ever a time in which you lost a loved one and, and had to find a way to go out there on the field in spite of what was happening? Uh, absolutely, Eric. I needed to find the strength uh, and the way or my thought process was uh, I needed to play better. I needed to play harder to honor them. Uh, and that's a way of, you know, in a way dealing with the grief. Uh, because at the end of the day, people expect you to perform. Uh, and that's the only thing that matters. A lot of people, or the majority of people, don't even know what you're going through, what you're mm -hmm. dealing with. And sometimes you were even afraid uh, to mention it because it might cost you uh, your place on the team. Uh, and at mm -hmm. the end of the day, you were judged only by performance, not by what were, what were you going through. While these are incredible feats in the face of personal tragedy, it creates this glossy narrative that pro athletes are superhuman and it only makes it harder for the next athlete who loses someone as we come to expect these big Hollywood endings. It might be the playoffs, it might be the begin, like the middle of the season, it could be the end of the season, and maybe for themselves, they don't want to let their coach, their teammates down. They then sacrifice what they need in order to perform in their sport. So there's a lot of pressure. I don't know, sometimes it's self-imposed. Other times they could feel pressure from outside to like keep going because like we need you, it's the playoffs. Or this is our chance to take it to, you know, to get to that postseason this year. That's a lot to bear while grieving. It's a lot of, it's a huge demand 
of your mental, physical, and emotional energy. During this dark period, Paul and Akela both say Paul has had to learn to open up more about his feeling, something that uh, did not come naturally to him at first. It's definitely not that I was reluctant to talk about it, but I'm a very happy guy. I'm always kind of smiling, laughing, um, and I just never felt like I wanted it to kind of bring me down into this serious state and, and this serious topic um, because I much rather kind of, you know, joke around, have a laugh. So de definitely wasn't reluctant to talk about it, um, but definitely as of late, I've, I've been able to kind of share and, 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 and kind of enjoy, um, you know, talking about this side of, of my life. For some athletes, emotions and expressing them is is frowned upon. Unless it's the emotion that you need to make tackles or the emotion that you need to run run really fast after like a, you know a serve or something. But it can be really difficult to express feelings of grief and loss. So they keep the lid on that. But it's important to share because that's when the healing can begin. My focus has always been on the field and when you're a professional athlete you know it's not just about what you do on the field it's about you know what you're doing off the field taking care of your body you're always thinking about you know rehydrating eating well sleeping the right amount you know like all of these things that you know require attention um, to kind of keep me going i would say that your mind controls your body so prioritize the thing that makes it all go so instead of this bottom up approach, so nutrition and training and weightlifting and all that, that's bottom up, top down. Cause the mind truly, it, it's in charge. It's the, it's the center, the epicenter of all of our performances. And it's the, obviously it's the epicenter of our moods in our, our mental state. As traumatic as the last few years have been for Paul, he says he's come out on the other side stronger. It's extremely important to be able to share share your story. Um, I'm definitely not one to express too much, um, I would say, and I think my fiance would agree with me. Oftentimes, I, I'll I'll hold back my emotion. I try and stay stay as as level headed as possible throughout kind of what I'm feeling. But I think as of late, I've I've gained this strength to be able to share kind of my story and be okay with people understanding what I've gone through because I know that it helps other people just as much as it helps me. It was almost like he just had to feel like he had to just turn on this happy face. But if you see now, now that he's accepted everything, gone through the motions, this year he's doing amazing because he's happy. So I guess it did affect him in his career rather than a, another season where he was just unhappy and constantly getting injured. He knew that it was because he mentally just wasn't okay because he tried his hardest to switch it and make sure that he was happy. He was going to perform. Doesn't matter what he's going through. He's always going to put 110%. And it's paying off because Paul is looking to represent the U.S. at the 2022 FIFA World Cup. He credits the people who have supported him along the way. Here's Paul. My fiance, for sure. You know, she she's been my rock, and you know her and and, and my 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 mother, who uh, has always supported me throughout everything, and she's gone through a lot of the grief and the loss that I have as well. And so, those are the two that I've that I that I've always leaned on. And of course, there are the people he's lost. My grandfather is the reason why I am where I am today. You know, for him and and, and my father was such a huge supporter of me. You know, loved all sports, loved, you know, soccer. He was my first coach and he was always there for me. And, and like I said, super proud, always supportive. And so, you know, it'll mean, it'll mean a lot for, for me to, to be able to be at the World Cup and, you know, just, just kind of play in their, in their memory. On the next episode of my new favorite footballista, this Ecuadorian midfielder had to choose between pursuing soccer or a formal education. Now he's making it easier for future generations of soccer players to finish their studies. In ese momento, At that ella, moment, I knew I had to leave Esmeraldas for another city. My mom didn't want me to go. And my dad said, yes, go ahead. And my mom, no, no. 
Finally, she said, fine, go, with tears in her eyes. Sad to see one of her kids leave her at such a young age. Get to know Sifu, Jose Sifuentes, on the next episode of my new favorite futbolista. Thank you for listening to my new favorite futbolista. There will be over 500 players at the World Cup, so we have more inspiring stories to tell. Go back to the My New Favorite Futbolista feed right now to hear previous episodes, and make sure to subscribe to get future episodes automatically downloaded to your device. This episode of My New Favorite Futbolista was produced by LX News and Telemundo. Juan Pablo Angel and I were your hosts. Janine Doyon wrote and edited this episode. Fernando Hurtado and Seth Rubenreut were the supervising producers. Matthew Glasser served as managing editor. Jeremy Berg and Matt Goldberg served as executive producers. Tony Pierce was the motion graphics designer with support from Aaron Pinnell. Justin Covington, Brad Fossler, James Jeffrey, Quatzin Gutierrez, and Sanjesh Singh were the production crew. Stephen Dawson was the media manager and quality control editor.